going to that. <laughs> I was enjoying that. Uh, take your Bible's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. New Year's is coming up week. You know, starting a new year. And of course, the one thing everybody always does this time of year is make New Year's resolutions. Everybody's always talking about New Year's resolutions. You know, I thought about that. People get sick of hearing about New Year's resolutions. So I thought that today we would talk about New Year's resolutions. So, yeah, what is that? I, it, have you ever made one? You know, a few years ago, I told Diane, I said, in the new year, I'm resolved to make no resolution. <laughs> Why is that? Because most of the time, people say, we're going to make New Year's resolution, and then they don't keep it. But sometimes they don't even try to keep it. You know? Or sometimes they figure out, well, this is just too hard to keep. And so they don't make any resolutions. Well, I found this, this list, uh, you know, everybody nowadays has got a top ten list, and I really don't know where this one came from, but I looked at them and I thought, okay, well, some of these are okay, some of them are kind of foolish, and uh, somebody went out and they polled a bunch of people at some point, on, you know, when it was coming up on New Year's, and they said, what is your New Year's resolution? And these were the top ten that they got, okay? Number one. This was the number one answer for a New Year's resolution. Spend more time with family and friends. That really ain't a bad one right there, is it? I mean, really, that's, that's a pretty good one. I kind of like that one. It's kind of shocking that somebody went out in public and public had one that was that good. Because most of the time nowadays you go out in public and you ask somebody something like this and it, it could go either way. Second one. Here's one. Have you ever heard this? I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to get in shape. How many times have we ever said that? Ah. You do what? Round. Round is a shape. That's right. Well, see, that's kind of followed up by the number three answer, which was lose weight. Okay, well, if you're going to get in shape, you'll lose weight, so you can kill two with one stone right there, okay? The fourth one was, quit smoking. That one ain't hard for me. I don't smoke. I, I heard one, <laughs> this guy, the two guys were at a party, and it was New Year's party, and so one of them came up, and, uh, and the guy asked his buddy, he said, can I bum a cigarette off of you? And the guy said, well, yeah, I guess so. He said, hey, have you made any New Year's resolutions as he was lighting up this borrowed cigarette, you know? And he said, well, yeah. My, my resolution is to quit smoking this year. And the guy looked at him and said, you just bumped the cigarette. What do you mean? You make it a resolution to quit smoking, you're sitting there smoking one. He said, yeah, but I'm just in the middle of phase one. <laughs> and he said, well, what's phase one? He said, I quit buying them. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, enjoy life more. Now that really is a good one too, but boy, that could take on a lot of different meanings, couldn't it? That could be really good, or it might not be so good. But enjoying life more would be good. Number six, quit drinking. That one ain't hard for me either. Number seven, get out of debt. I will just tell you right now, if there's anybody in this room that can make that resolution and get out of debt this year, I want to know your secret. <laughs> I just want to know it. But it's not a bad resolution. I mean, come on. You know, getting out of debt's a good thing. So we ought to be at least working toward that. Number eight was learn something new. You're never too old to learn. There's a lot of people that have the attitude that I got too much to worry about without having to deal with something else. You know, I've said this before. Diane, she cringes every time I say this. There used to be a Sprite commercial on television and the slogan for this commercial was give your brain a rest obey your thirst every time that commercial came on Diane would just do like this because I would just go off on the TV that's what's wrong with us nowadays is we rest in our brains a little too much we need to use those things with some, for something besides a hat rack Folks, God gave us a brain to use it, and God wants us to learn. The first thing we ought to try to learn more about is Him. That's the first thing. 
Okay, but God gives us the capacity to learn. We ought to use that. Learn something new. Number nine, here's a real good one. Help others. Help others. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. And then here's one that I really just... I don't know how to do it. Get organized. <laughs> Get organized. Josh and I are already working on that at my house. Uh, uh, for the last two or three days, he's been about to kill me uh, cleaning up my mess. But let me tell you something. We've made three trips already to the dump trying to get organized, okay? That's a good one. But really, is that worthy of making a resolution about it? Folks, let me tell you something. I've never been real good with New Year's resolutions, but I think I came up with one or two this year that might be pretty good, and I find them in Ephesians chapter 5. If you would, stand with me as we read together. <clears throat> we're going to start reading in verse 15, and we're going to go through verse 20. Now, if you pay close attention, you'll find out what I'm talking about here. Paul, when he wrote this letter, gave us some real good New Year's resolutions. They should be resolutions that are life resolutions for us. Things that we ought to do for the rest of our life. Listen as he writes. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love those verses. And I love what Paul is trying to tell us to do in our lives when we look into this. Father, I pray that You would help us to understand Your Word. I pray that we would not only understand it, but we would apply it in our lives, that it would take meaning in our heart, and Heavenly Father, we would live it before a world that needs You. Heavenly Father, I pray that You would just bless this group who is here today. And Lord, have Your will and Your way in all of our hearts and all of our lives, and we'll praise You for us in Your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. You know what? I think the first New Year's resolution that we can look at right here is, is found right there in verse 15. And it's simply this. Be careful. Be careful. You know what? I, I, yeah, my boys will tell you this. My wife will tell you this. My mother will tell you this. Mama took off to Tennessee for three weeks. You know, Thursday she just got in the car and took off and called me after she was almost in line and said, hey, I'm on the way. And, and you know what I said? Be careful. <laughs> you know, we all do that, don't we? We tell everybody, we tell our loved ones, be careful. Why? Because we don't want any harm to come to them. Is that what Paul's talking about here? Well, it could be. You know, my youngest son, Ike, called me last night and said, hey, just want to let you know, uh, we're in Atlanta, we're headed out. And I'm thinking, okay. And I started to say, be careful. But he ain't got nothing to do with it. I started to say, tell the pilot, be careful. You know, because they were flying to Dallas last night. And I thought, you know what? We, have you ever seen somebody who's just accident prone? Really? I mean, there are some people just accident prone. They get hurt walking down the hall. And sometimes their mind is in 12 different places at one time and they're not paying attention. Do you know what? Even medical people will tell you that people who are accident prone most of the time are in too big a hurry and they worry about too much and they got way too much stress in their life and all of that leads to accidents, which leads to them getting hurt. Now, I've been hurt before. You know the thing about being hurt? It hurts. That's the thing about being hurt. I don't like it, you know? And I try to be careful, but now things happen sometimes. But is that what really Paul is talking about here? No, that's not what he's talking about. In verse 15, it says right here, uh, let me get, get back to it. I've lost my place. There it is. And see then that you walk circumspectly. You know that word circumspectly, circumspectly means? It means walk cautiously. You know what that word walk literally translates to? Live. This has to do, Paul is speaking with how we live our lives. 
We are to walk lives that are different. Be careful, he says, in the way that you live your life. Well, what is he talking about? What kind of way are we supposed to live? He goes on and tells us. He says, be wise. How many of us would like to be more wise? I know I would. I'd like to be wiser in my life. Okay? So how do we get that? Well, what does the Bible say? That's the one thing that people don't understand. Look, if there's a question or if you have a question, the first place you ought to look is in God's Word. Amen. Because there is an answer for it in there. What does the Bible say is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Yeah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Listen, there's a lot of people out there who are real smart that ain't got one day of common sense. My mom and daddy, when I was a teenager up in Virginia, everything got blamed on Dave at my house. But at his house, everything got blamed on me. Now, let me tell you something about Dave. Love the man to death. Very smart. Very smart. Electrical engineering degree, master's degree in physics. Retired colonel in the Air Force. I mean, this guy is brilliant. Okay, he's brilliant. But even I got a little bit worried about Dave when we were in high school because let me tell you something. I don't even think he knew what the initials were to common sense. <laughs> now, you take somebody that smart with absolutely no common sense, that could be dangerous. <laughs> That could be dangerous. I'm not going to tell you about it up here, but remind me to tell you about the longest night of my life one time. It was Dave's fault. <laughs> it was Well, I say it was Dave's fault. I was there. I was involved. But it wasn't my idea to begin with. Okay? But let me tell you something. We are to live wisely. And the only way to get wisdom is to spend time in God's Word. He says, be careful with the way you live your life. Don't live foolishly. Live wisely. Live according to the Word of God. Folks, let me tell you something. That means our time. You ask somebody what the most valuable commodity they have is, and nine out of ten of them are going to tell you time. That's the thing that's most important. Either they ain't got enough of it left or they got way too much of it on their hands. But time is important. And how you spend your time is important. Let me ask you a question. How much time every day do you spend just talking to God or praying to God or studying about God and His Word? How much time do you give to God every day? And you know what? It's not just praying and it's not just reading the Word even though even though those are very important. Those are two very important things. Y'all have heard me, those of you who remember, have heard me say this time and time again. There's two things we have to do as Christians and as a church if we want to be what God wants us to be. And that is we have to spend time in God's Word and we have to pray. Amen. Period. We've got to do those two things. And we need to be doing it more and more. But you know what? There's more to giving God your time than just spending time in the Word and praying. What do you do for other people? What do you do for God? When you live your life day in and day out, you come into contact with people at all places and all times during the day. Do you give God that time and ask Him to bless that time with those other people? Folks, let me tell you something. We need to be giving every bit of our time to God. All of it. Folks, it's not ours to begin with. It's God. If we have time on this earth, guess who allowed it? God does. God does. It's not our time. It's God's time. And we ought to live wisely with our time. Folks, when Paul says here to be careful, he's not talking about being careful physically. That's just a given. He's talking about being careful spiritually. We need to be careful with our spiritual lives. What does God say? God said, be still and know that I am God. Listen to me. Colossians 3. Verses 1 through 4. If you then be risen with Christ. In other words, if you're a Christian. Okay? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Let me ask something. Are you, are you worldly minded or are you Christ-like? Are your things set on things above or down here on this earth? Are you more worried about what we have going on down here than what God has going on up there? Because what's eternal? That up there is eternal, not this down here. Amen. We ought to be concentrating 
on what God wants us to concentrate on. Be careful how you live. He goes on. He says, uh, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, I like this, who is our life? Paul wrote that class. He said, when Christ, who is our life, let me tell you something. People think about, boy, i got a wonderful life. You better thank God for it. Amen. Amen. Because your life belongs to God, whether you believe it or not. Amen. You know, I, I talked to a guy one time. I said, look, ultimately, you, can't, you, only, you can only follow one or two people. You can follow Christ or you can follow Satan. He said, I just don't believe that. And I said, it don't matter what you believe, brother. <laughs> because what I'm telling you is the truth. Folks, let me tell you something. He says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. It may happen this year. It may happen this year. He might decide to come back and say, you stop and think about that? Does that scare you? Or does that excite you? If it scares you, we need to talk. Listen. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Folks, let me tell you something. Paul says in both of these books, we ought to be careful how we live our life because when Christ appears, we'll either appear with Him or we won't. We need to be careful. We need to live our life in Christ and be careful with how we live our life. You know, God gives us Direction. You know, we going down the highway looking for signs of where we're supposed to get off the interstate or turn on this road or whatever. I read a story one time about a guy who was driving a truck. He was making some deliveries and he went to pull into this alley at this building. And as he was pulling in, he saw a sign that had been handwritten and said, Alleyway blocked. Do not enter. Hard to turn around. And he thought somebody's playing a joke. And he pulled on in there anyway. And guess what he found out? <laughs> that the alley was blocked and that it was really hard to turn around. He said, I spent about an hour and a half trying to turn my truck around. And I finally was able to get it turned around and started back out. And on the opposite side of the sign that somebody had handwritten put up there, you know what it said on the opposite side? I told you. <laughs> I thought that's pretty good. You know what? We need to live our life carefully so that one day God doesn't have to look at us and say, I told you. Amen. Folks, listen. God gives us direction. Be careful with the direction that you take and be careful with the way you live your life. The second one is, be thoughtful. Look at verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know what that means? Be filled with it means be controlled by. You ever seen somebody that was really drunk? I have uh, encountered a few in my life, especially doing what I did up there. You know, and they'll tell you everything in the world. So I'm not drunk. But you ought to see the video. It's not hard to tell if they're drunk. Okay? You know why? Because they're not in control. You know, when I was working in law enforcement, we had to do something called standardized field sobriety. If we stopped somebody and we suspected that they were drinking and driving and they were impaired, we would ask them to do a few standardized field sobriety tests. I like to do them on sober people because there's a lot of sober people who can't do them. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know what? You all see some of the videos from the in-car camera because I always put them in front of the car to do these field sobriety tests, you know? And it is amazing because sometimes they would say, hey, let me show you this one. And they would just, <laughs> oh, it was funny. You had to see the video. I mean, because they were not in control, the alcohol was controlling them. And Paul right here and God tells us, look, don't put that mess in your body because it controls you. What you need to be controlled by is the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say be thoughtful, what am I talking about? You need to be thinking about what the Holy Spirit who indwells you as a Christian wants you to do. 
There are times when the Spirit tells us what we should do. And guess what? I know this is hard to believe in this church with all these wonderful Christians. But sometimes the Spirit may want us to do something but we don't want to. And before you get down on yourself too bad, and, and believe me, we've all done it. Y'all know I've done it. We've all done it. Sometimes God says, you need to do this, and we say, uh-uh, that ain't for me. But let me tell you something. Be sure you're going to do it sooner or later. Because God don't give up. And God knows what's best. You look at all the people. Look at, look at Jonah. Ask him if it was such a good idea to run from God. Folks, God will have His will and His way in the life of His children. It just depends on how hard-headed you are. We need to be thinking about this. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be thoughtful of God's Spirit who lives within us. But folks, we need to be thinking about others as well. I don't know who wrote this, but I found it and I, I, I cut it out because I wanted to read it. This is just an excerpt from an article, and the name of the article was How to Be Miserable. I don't know of anybody that's standing in that line, to be honest with you, how to be miserable. But this, And I thought it was pretty good when I read it. It says this, think about yourself. Talk about yourself. Use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others. Let me ask something. Does it bother you what other people think about you? You know, I guess to some degree it probably bothers me. We, we all want to be well thought of, but let me tell you something. I care less what somebody thinks about me. I'm more worried about what God thinks about me. Yeah. And I have told people this. Look, I know that God and I are okay with me and what I'm doing. So you don't really matter. <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes you have to be kind of direct with people. But folks, let me tell you something. If you are doing what God wants you to do and you're thinking about the Holy Spirit and His direction in your life, then other people are going to think well of you because God is in control. says, use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others. Listen greedily to what people say about you. Expect to be appreciated. Be suspicious. Be jealous and envious. Be sensitive to slights. Never forgive a criticism. Trust nobody but yourself. Insist on consideration and respect. Demand agreement with your own views and every, on everything. Sulk if people are not grateful to you for favor shown to them. And never forget a service that you have rendered. Shirk your duties if you can and do as little as possible for others. If you want to be miserable, there's a formula right there. I cut it out. I think I'm going to save it. But if we want to be happy, we think about other people. We think about God first, and then we think about others. I got to tell you, 19, shoot, I can't remember, 79, I guess it was. I met a lady. She's going on to be with the Lord now. She was 94 when she died. Her name was Hazel Goodson. My daddy was pastor in Providence Baptist Church in Providence, North Carolina. That's the church that licensed me to preach. Miss Hazel was a member of that church lived right behind my mom and dad. And I promise you, I knew that lady for a long, long time. I never heard her say a bad word about anybody. And I can tell you for a fact that from the moment that she got up in the morning, until the time that she laid down to go to sleep at night, her only thought was this, what can I do for somebody else? I have never seen anything like it. The last several years of her life, she had to go to a nursing home. She got old and she couldn't take care of herself. But you know what? She And we still have a, a, a king size 
hand crocheted, I have to ask Diane about this, she crocheted us a king size uh, blanket to go on our bed. And we still got it and we still use it. I mean, she was all the time doing stuff like that. Get this, her mother, who at the time we got married in 1980 was 91, also hand crocheted us another king size. <laughs> and we still got it. And let me tell you something, this lady, when she was in that nursing home, the only thing she could do was sit there and crochet, but she made dish tie and, and, and dish rack. And every time we walked in that nursing home in Yanceville, North Carolina, to see Hazel, she was pulling out stuff to give to Diane. Every thought she ever had. was for someone else. I've never, ever seen a happier, more content person than Hazel Gibson. Never had. And she never once thought about herself. Others be thoughtful. Don't be so self-centered. Be Christ-centered. Listen to Matthew. I love this. Matthew 22 and verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But then you love others. You don't be so self-centered. We need to think more of God than we, need, than we think of ourselves. We need to pray more. We need to read more scripture. We need to praise more. We need to be careful, we need to be thoughtful, but we also look at verse 19 and 20. We need to be thankful. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Let me tell you something. Have you ever met somebody that was just an ungrateful person? Not very fun to be around, I can tell you that. We are to live gratefully. Let me ask you a question. Are you aware of how many blessings God has bestowed upon you? Stop and think about it. You stop and start counting your blessings, you know, like we sing in that hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. Have you ever done that? If you stop and think about the blessings that God has placed in your life, you have no choice but to be grateful. Amen. Somebody that does not realize their blessings or they ignore their blessings, they are the most ungrateful people in the world. But I think that if we seriously... Stop and consider what all God has done for us. We can't help but be thankful to God for what He's done. Amen. And we need to tell Him that. Do you do, you, do you do things that, you know, we're taught when we're little, when we're children, we're taught to be polite, right? We're taught to say thank you and please and yes ma'am and no ma'am. You know what? I remember one time I was at a church and the pastor, he's a great guy, loved him, he lives in Florida now. His kids were, were young. And, uh, you know, I, I went up to one of them and I said, son, good morning, how you doing? And I asked a question. And his son looked at me and said, yeah, just like that. And I was kind of taken back. And I thought, hmm, wow, yeah. Where I'm from, you say, yes, sir. You know? And I didn't point that out. But I got to know some. They did that with everybody. Said, yeah, no, what? Well, you know what? I figured it out. They weren't from around here. They were from up north. And guess what? They don't do that up north. They don't teach their kids to say yes ma'am, no ma'am. It's yep, nope, whoop, you know, just. 
I don't know. It seemed kind of impolite to me. But they didn't know any better. That's what they were taught. You know what? When we start reading God's Word and God teaches us through His Word, He teaches us some things, doesn't He? And one of the things that He is trying to teach us is we need to be grateful for what He's blessed us with. We need to be grateful. Are you polite or are you rude? You know, I've met rude people too. I know you have too. You've been somewhere and somebody said something or did something and they walk off and all of a sudden you look around at whoever you went and go, boy, that was kind of rude. You know, y'all ever done that? Sure you have. You met rude people. Well, let, let me ask you in a different way. Uh, are you rude to God? I mean, it's one thing to be rude to another person, but are we rude to God? Are we being rude to God? <laughs> if we're not thanking Him for what He's done for us, we're being rude. You know, there have been people that have done things for me, and I can't remember all of them, but let me tell you something. I always try to thank them for what they did because it is special to me that they think enough of me to be able to, to want to do something for me. I mean, come on. It's special to me. And so I try to let them know how grateful I am. Folks, let me tell you something. Do we thank God enough for what He's done for us? We ought to be thanking Him every day. Folks, everything that we have, including the breath that He gives us, is because He gave it to us. Are we grateful? Are you grateful you woke up this morning? Are you grateful that you were still breathing when you became conscious this morning? Are you grateful that you could get up in a nice house where it was warmer than outside? Are you grateful that you could, you know, take a shower inside? <laughs> Believe me, when I was a kid, I remember them outside showers with a water hose thrown over the, over the clothesline. No hot water. Quick shower? <laughs> I remember that. Are you thankful? Let me ask you this. you thankful you were able to come to God's house today? Or th are you thankful that God loved you enough to die on a cross to save you so that you could be a part of a church like this? Amen. Then you need to be thankful. Folks, we need to be thankful people. We need to be grateful people. He deserves our thanks. Family sitting at the dinner table. And of course, there. Their, their custom as ours is is when they sit down to a meal they all bowed their head and they, they said a blessing and so they took turns in this family saying the blessing and so it, it was the five year old's turn to say the blessing and so they were sitting down to dinner and they all got there and they said okay honey it's your time to say the blessing and so this little five year old bowed her head and she started praying and the first thing out of her mouth was dear God thank you for these pancakes and she went on and finished her prayer. And when she got done, her mother looked at her and said, well, honey, that was a very nice prayer. But we're not having pancakes, we're having chicken. Why did you thank God for the pancakes? She said, I just wanted to see if he was paying attention. <laughs> you got to love that. Let me tell you something. And I'm going to go ahead and clear up a mystery for you. God's always paying attention. Amen. God's always paying attention. He knows when we're thankful and when we're not. He knows when we have hearts full of gratitude for what He's done for us. I want to read you. I love this scripture too if I can find it. Psalm chapter 103. I love it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. You know what that means? That's everything He's done for us. Here's the best verse. He's praising God. In verse 3 He says, uh, Who forgives all thine iniquity. What's the most precious thing in your life? It better be Jesus. Because He's the one that saves you from your sin. 
He says, who forgives all your iniquities and who heals your diseases. Oh, folks, listen. You ever stop and think about what the opposite of praising is? The only way I know to say this is the opposite of praising is complaining. Listen, complaining doesn't, I wrote this down because I like it, complaining doesn't change anything or make things better. It amplifies frustration, it spreads discontent and discord, and can invoke an invitation for the devil to cause havoc in our lives. Ooh, stop and think about that now. It can invoke an invitation for the devil to come in and create havoc in our lives when we complain. Because when we complain, our focus is not on God, it's on us and our situation. And folks, when we start looking at our situation and the circumstances that we're in at the present, we take our eyes off of God. And when we take our eyes off of God, then we become vulnerable. Now let me tell you something. I've said this church and I'm going to say it here. Not only can this invoke an invitation for the devil to wreak havoc in our lives, but when we start having it in God's house, it also invokes an invocation for uh, an invitation for Satan to come into the church and destroy. And what's the one thing I've been telling you? I say the one thing other than pray and read more scripture. I guess this is another thing that I've been telling y'all. Things are good right now. We got a great spirit in our church, and I thank God for it. Satan don't like it. He wants in. He wants in. And he's looking for any little crack in a seam that he can get in there. Folks, let me tell you something. We better live thankful and praise God and keep our focus on him. And if we keep our focus on him, he'll keep the devil out. And that's what we have to do. And we have to do that as individuals, but also as a church. Folks, let me tell you something. Complaining don't do a bit of good. It just causes things to get worse. Listen to what Philippians says about complaining. Verse 14, chapter 2, do all things without complaining. <laughs> murmurings is the way the King James says it, but it means complaining. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He was talking about the world being a, a crooked and perverse nation when he wrote Philippians. But the Bible also says there's nothing new under the sun. Guess what? We're living in the middle of a perverse and wicked nation right now. And we're supposed to be a light to those people out there. That's why he says, don't complain. Look to God and be a light to those people. Let me tell you something. If we're grateful people, if we are thankful people, we'll be the light that God needs for us to be. A thankful person is a great witness. Is a great witness, and that's what we're supposed to be, is a great witness. Folks, you want to be happy this year? Then walk with God. Amen. Be careful in the way you live. Be thoughtful of others and God. But be thankful. Be happy. Folks, there is way too much sorrow in this world. We're supposed to be happy. If the world looks at us and all they see is a sour, miserable person, they don't want any part of it. But if they see happy people, then they're going to be drawn to us because they want to know why you're happy. Why you're happy. Are you careful with the way you live your life? Let me encourage you to be in the next year. Do you think about God's wishes instead of your own? And do you think about others and how you can help them? I encourage you to in the coming year. But most of all, I encourage you to be thankful because when you're thankful, you're happy. Heavenly Father, I pray that today that your word would speak to hearts.
Lord, I ask that you would just have your will and your way in the lives of your people. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us strength in the coming year to be what you want us to be. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be careful in the way we live our life and to think of others more than we think of ourselves. But most of all, Heavenly Father, may we praise you and show thanks and gratitude to you for everything that you have done for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that your will would be done now for it's in your name we pray. Amen.